Hey, my name is Chelsea Fagan, and I'm the founder and CEO of The Financial Diet, a totally independently owned and operated company of women who love to talk about money. Welcome to The Financial Confessions, a weekly show where we talk to people about their personal finances, their professional industry, and how money shapes their lives. You can listen to or watch new episodes of The Financial Confessions every week on YouTube or your preferred streaming platform. You can also support TFD and get exclusive access to our entire catalog of ad-free bonus videos, workshops, Discord community, our book club, and more by joining our members-only community on Patreon or YouTube. Our 2024 goal is to be primarily supported by our incredible community, and joining our membership program is the best way to do that. Enjoy the episode! Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Financial Confessions. This one is one of the few this season that we are doing remote. You'll probably have noticed we've done a few of them remote. Um, Today, we are going to be talking with a guest who hit so many of the different boxes that you guys asked us to address when we put out the call for topics this season. Um, Not only is our guest a military veteran, she is also someone who struggles with PTSD, who has ADHD, who is legally disabled, and who just just generally lives a life that makes implementing a lot of the financial advice we see day to day, even on places like our channel, um, really, really difficult, if not sometimes completely impossible. Uh, Because her experience spans so many of these different topics, we knew we absolutely had to speak with her, learn about her story, and learn about how she handles money, uh, even in spite of all of those things. Uh, Without further ado, I want to welcome my guest today, Jessica Oudbeer. Hello. One of the reasons that we really wanted to reach out to you is when you were speaking with our um, booker, Alexa, in your first email, you had mentioned um, that your situation can often make a lot of financial advice feel totally unapplicable, if not impossible. Could you share a little bit um, about what you mean by that? Of course. And So when it comes to talking about my financial history, you are talking about, just like with everybody, their personal history. So it's like how you grew up with money and the rest of it. But if you throw on top of whatever your background noise is, an inability to focus on tasks, an inability to know what day it is or what time it is. Like today, I was very impressed with myself for wearing pants on time. Yay, go team. Um, If you throw on top of that a shift schedule in the military that also doesn't contribute to your understanding of time, Doing things like paying bills on time, making a schedule, et cetera, when all of those things are constantly in flux feels kind of insulting. It's like not insulting from the person giving the advice, but you feel like it's like, well, this doesn't apply to me. Well, this doesn't apply to me. Oh, crap. This doesn't apply to me. I guess I'm just hosed. So you kind of have to like cobble together your own form of advice that sounds absolutely insane to anyone else. Well, let's take it a step back then. Can you talk, can you tell us about um, just a little bit of your personal story and kind of uh, how you got to the position that you're in today and illuminate us a little bit on what your financial situation is? Of course. Um, I grew up, my mother was raised to be underneath like a wealthy household, but she didn't learn to manage money on her own. My father was also poor and he was the person who joined the military. So between the two of them, you have two individuals who are not good at managing money. You have these two people split for various reasons, and my mother ended up with the children despite being insane. So she doesn't know how to manage money. She's receiving child support from a person who also can't manage money, and she's not emotionally or psychologically able to decide between, do I need a new pair of bongo jeans, or should I feed the children? What that led into was a circumstance in which it became incumbent upon me as the oldest to find ways to make money, which led to circumstances that were less than stellar. You know, in that case, you can put your trigger warnings up here. But I, as a child, had to do things to make money that were not legal, fair, good or any of those things. So with that background in mind, I already had to, you know, really hop on immediately what do we need? How do we get this? And where do I put it? You know what I mean? So it's, it was already like an immediate amount of juggling. And so with that history and background later, when I joined the service and had a lot more structure, it was easier for me to learn some of those skills, but then also being assaulted within the military really threw that for a loop as well. So it's like, you try to build your foundation on shaky ground, it falls over. So I'm really good at rebuilding that tower from scratch from whatever pieces are around. So it's got an upside to it. It's just really hard one. And as I mentioned, you are currently uh, living primarily financially on disability payments. Is that fair to say? 
Um, I do live with my husband. We are married. We are together. And it does add a lot of stress and tension that my income is left over from being assaulted to receive a monthly check that says, hey, sorry, we couldn't get you justice and chose not to do anything about it. Here's two grand. Have fun with that. So every month I get a nice little check that says, we broke you. We're not going to do much else about it. Here's your money. On that note, um, can you explain for people who might not understand, we've had a guest on before who broke down a little bit for us what the actual process of um, seeking out disability and actually receiving it each month, as well as a lot of the sort of details around, you know, how much you can earn, what you can do, all of that kind of thing. But um, this wasn't a person who was receiving military benefits specifically. So could you walk us through just logistically what it looks like to actually secure those benefits each month? And is it something that you have to continually renew? Is it in per perpetuity? So for me in particular, I'm medically retired at 80%. I hope to increase that to later. When you're first getting out of the military, you have to prove that you are disabled to a certain degree to a medical board. What this means is you show up to a very tired and overworked individual who says, you have PTSD, you look fine. And then you have to argue your point over and over. This is exactly how I am broken. To me, it was very difficult to contain my anger when I was saying things like, this is how you broke me, as opposed to saying, this is what is wrong in a very calm and logical manner when calm and logical is not necessarily how you're feeling when a board bureaucrat asks you, why are you broken and why should we pay you? So it's a very inhuman situation. They go through your entire medical record and try to say, well, this was before service. This was before service. We couldn't possibly do that. Their job is to pay you as little as possible. Some people, you do get the occasional good person who's going to help you sort through all of this. There are agencies that do that, but finding the ones that aren't frauds, finding the ones that aren't preying upon the vulnerable is very difficult. For me, again, luck plays a big role into why I'm standing here today, but um, I lucked out in being able to document a lot of things because I was very religious about the documenting issues as they happened. That going forward, I wasn't considered broken enough, so I'm only 80% percent disabled and shortly after like five years later they want you to visit every year they want to see but are you still have ptsd are you still broken how broken are you on a scale of one to you know do we need to cart you off somewhere and so it's a very dehumanizing process especially if the reason why you're there is from military sexual trauma so there's like here stand in this group of of men dressed in uniform and tell us exactly how you feel today and Spitting rage doesn't necessarily get you the percentage points that you need to survive. But when left with the option between do I spit in the face and try to go for justice and achieve zero resources for my children, or do I take the check? Do I take the, take the check and sell my pride? And I chose to sell my pride. It sucks, but here we are. So, Was there also a legal battle involved with, uh, with this process? There was in the sense that I tried to get the people who were assaulting me to no longer be in the service. And mm -hmm. during that time period of me saying, hey, we have people who are assaulting other people on the ship. We need to get rid of them. I was informed of, hey, if you get out now and drop this legal case, you'll be able to have a lot more money for your children than if you try to fight this all the way through. Because you're fighting a losing battle. You're not going to win. These people are going to make rank. There's nothing you can do about it. And so it was drop the cases and make more money that I could use, actually use to heal myself later on or fight the good fight and sacrifice myself and my children on that altar. Well, first of all, I'm so sorry that this is something that you had to go through. Um, and kind of on a, a practical level, you know, unless I'm missing something, it sounds like the disabilities that, although you have had them legally recognized, um, they are mostly invisible to the people around you um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that's something that our audience um, really wants us to focus on because I think um, this is not at all to suggest that people who have a more visible disability have an easier time. Obviously it comes with its own enormous set of challenges. But I think for a lot of people, there is a very unique kind of frustration with having uh, a disability that doesn't register to most people or doesn't seem, I hate to use the word, but doesn't seem real enough to a lot right. of the people around you. 
Um, and I want to kind of learn from you both on a practical day-to-day -day level, but also on an emotional level, how that is something you experience and navigate. As a personality trait, I like to talk. I like to emote. I like to smile. So even in my worst days, I'm still capable of at least faking these things because I like interacting with my children in a positive way. But when it comes to actually maintaining a job, the hardest days are where I am completely shut down, where I cannot feel anything, where I can't make my face do the things that women historically are required to do, which is to smile, emote, be pretty, be engaging. Even right now, I am not feeling half of the emotions on my face. I have medicated myself to the point where I don't really feel much, including the bad feelings. What that means is when on the days that the mask slips, I... I can't work in fields or jobs that require me to work with other humans. It's very disorienting for people to be with a blank slate on days where I'm so depressed that I cannot get out of bed. It looks like laziness. I literally cannot get out of bed, but nobody sees that because I'm in bed. So <laughs> it's not like a disability that someone can interact with when I am well, like I'm well ish. Now I'm getting my ADHD needs met through medication and actually going through and making sure that I'm healthy. When I'm on, I am vibrant. I can do jobs. I can work all day. I can sit and schedule things. And I know where things are generally. I can clean the house. But what they don't see is my off days. And on my off days is not when I'm going to court. On my off days is not when I signed up in Michigan for disability, where the judge literally said, you are too smart. You are too verbose and bubbly. You have all these skills. Of course, you're employable. And I'm like, yeah, because the other half of the year, I'm in bed in my pajamas and openly weeping with no expression on my face, which is not good for employment. So it's those situations of being like, when I'm well enough is when I can fight for myself for when I am weak, if that makes sense. So trying to explain Absolutely. that to people who don't have to do energy management in any stretch of the form where they have kind of crummy days and kind of okay days. It's like, no, man. This is my peak. This is me at peak functioning right now. That is the only reason how I could get here. Well, you mentioned that you're on uh, various medications for mm -hmm. your mental health. Um, and I've personally experienced, but I also know that a lot of people um, have been through it who are listening, um, that oftentimes accessing medication when you need it can be one of the highest kind of barriers to wellness um, mm -hmm. that exists. And particularly for ADHD, it's as if, you know, it were a sort of puzzle designed to thwart people with ADHD to get the medication. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about how sort of not, I don't want to say your tips and tricks because, you know, everyone's situation is different, but how you personally managed to find and, and acquire the right medication for you. When you grow up within the military system of healthcare, so if you're born like I was on a military base and then you join the service immediately after high school, there is no gap in your experience with the civilian healthcare system until you get rudely dumped out of it right after giving birth. And then you're like, oh, it's like a whole other language I got to learn now. That's fantastic. But one of the skills that I had was asking for, do research first, obviously, but in circumstances where you need medication, like I needed to see an ADHD specialist, I literally just showed up and said, Bill TRICARE. It was just like, just send it off to them. And every time TRICARE tried to call me back and say, hey, you were supposed to fill out form 10, 6, 9, whatever. And I'm just like, cool, man, I still need to see this specific doctor who specializes with women with ADHD. And the more they kept trying to be like, well, doc, your pay that. And I'm like, fine, go for it. It's not like I was, you know, it's not like you weren't going to do that to begin with. And so the level of precarity that you start out with is what your limit of what you can handle is. You know what I mean? Like if you start at the bottom, it's all up from here. How you start out from at the bare bottom is I just literally showed up and started asking for it over and over again. And if I kept being met with things like, oh, this is drug seeking behavior. And I said, well, I have half of a bunch of degrees. If I wanted math, I would just make it myself. I don't really need your permission to do that. However, you know, if I feel well enough on the days, that's a stay at home job if there ever was one, you know, so and you don't need to clean the house if it catches on fire. So win win for everybody. But it's if it's drug seeking behavior, I would have a lot more other things. You need to help me with my ADHD. I will not get better otherwise. So you can either help or get out of the way. Those are your options. You do have to be pushy. Sometimes I do have to have my husband go on the line because he has a man voice 
to do that for me because if they hear my voice, the answer is, do you have an adult that can help you with that? Which is super fun. And with my, you know, trigger response to rage, it's not very conducive. So if you have a calm person in your life who can pretend to be you for 15 minutes on a phone call with some jackass who has no idea what you're doing, have them make the phone call. If they have a better people pleasy voice, if they can tone switch better than anyone else, then that is the person you want to talk to to make those initial phone calls. Once you know somebody, a doctor you can relatively trust with air quotes around that, then is when you can tell them honestly, look, these are the symptoms I have. I think it's ADHD. I don't think it's depression. I don't think it's PTSD. Can we try it, please? Or I think venlafaxine is slowly killing me. Can you please take me off of it or at least not have me on double the adult dose? That'd be fantastic. I don't want to stroke out tomorrow. I just turned 35. Let's not. So it's if you're straightforward with them, get to the point immediately. Usually they want to help you, but it's finding that person in the first place and getting through all the bull crap ahead of time. So find your people, use their skills. And yeah, and be a bit of a Karen, it sounds like. A Karen yeah, for justice. I'm a Karen for justice. You know, I almost went the full hair route. I wanted to just get more of the... <laughs> It's more of the thing, but it impedes my ability to not do that. So, so you mentioned your husband. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about on the show is how heterosexual partnerships um, and marriages intersect with a lot of, you know, the financial and uh, personal obstacles that women face in life. Um, you know, obviously division of labor in the home is often very unequal. Um, you know, women often kind of find themselves in a worst of both worlds situations where they're having to work full time and also having to take on the majority of the responsibility at home. Um, as someone who is in a rather unique situation yourself, but who is also in that more traditional, um, you know, hetero marriage with children uh, structure, how do you, uh, how, how does your, how do your diagnoses, your, uh, your PTSD, your ADHD, all of this, how do they intersect with that traditional structure? And how do you kind of carve out a role for yourself within that family structure that feels sustainable to you, even with a lot of those external, external sort of gendered norms? When we started our relationship and this is important. He, he was in the service. I was in the service. He was on my boat. We fell in love. And by fell in love, I mean, his wife left him or they left each other or something happened. I had a string of crappy boyfriends. I was a 20 year old child. He's not much older than I am. He was lonely. I was lonely. I got pregnant despite being told that I couldn't be pregnant in my head. It felt like the most wonderful thing to happen because I was told I would never have a family which is something that I craved deeply, which is kind of selfish looking back at it now. But again, I was a 20 year old child. I kind of give her some grace. You know what I mean? I just kind of 20 year old me was not well. So when we met and we got together and I found out I was pregnant, it was in the middle of my deployment. This is a career ender. I lost my next billet. I lost my two pens that I was working on. It's a thing you work really hard for. People usually do one at a time. It takes them a decade. I managed to do it in one fell swoop. I can consistently ground the entire time. I was really career oriented. I didn't want to take a man's last name, nothing. I wanted nothing to do with men in that regard other than to play with them. So I never wanted to get married. Yeah, you see where this is going. Now I'm a stay at home housewife a couple of years later, here we are. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, life happens when you're busy planning for life. Um, so when I ended up being pregnant, what impressed me about him is A, we're the same rank, and B, he's competent at everything. It's one of those guys that just picks things up and does really well at him. I figured out that that comes out at a cost later down the road, but you know, it took a couple of years of marriage to figure that one out. But uh, So when we met, he knew I was pregnant before I did because he was like, hey, you need more food. You haven't eaten in like two days because you're pregnant with my kid. And I'm like, yeah, buddy, that's creepy. Get off of me. And then so he was, he noticed that. His reaction was to bring me food at regular intervals. His reaction was to find a place located between his base and mine. His reaction was to find a car that both of us could operate because neither of us had vehicles prior to leaving because we're forward deployed a lot. That was his response to it. So when we moved in together, it was with the understanding of, so we're going to try to have a kid and be a couple. You don't have to stick around if you don't want to. 
Like, I'm not going to trap you like my mom did. I'm not going to do repeat the history of the past. But if you are going to be here, here are my rules and regulations. I am not going to be doing all the housework. I am not going to be doing all the cooking and cleaning. It's going to be physically impossible because I'll be deployed half the time. Like, you need to figure this out because if you're not, you can just leave. Like, I, I literally do not have time between one deployment to the next. It turns out wow. that my body, yeah. So it was like, it, but it was more backed by necessity. Because I had yeah. that background in necessity, if I was just saying it for myself, I think we're taught not to do that. But because it was the necessity of, I'm going to be on a boat. So if you don't figure this out, you will literally starve. So good luck with that, buddy. Here's a kid, have fun. He had to learn and he did learn and he did it to the best of his ability. So with that foundation set, it really does require a person to sink or swim. You can either be part of the relationship and do your, do your work or not. Later down the road, it leads to resentment though, because as I started getting more and more broken down by just having to rebuild myself after childhood and the rest of it, he had to take on more work. And so when he left the military, there was resentment because he's like, why do I have to get a job and also take care of you? Like we were equal. What happened? You know, you were the strong, tough woman who was going off and fighting the world and didn't want to get married or have kids. Now we have two kids. You're fully disabled. You can't finish college. What's going on here? We had to renegotiate a bunch of other things where I'm like, hey, man, I'm disabled. So I guess I'm doing housework now. It fell into that regardless of how many conversations, regardless of how many conscious thoughts, regardless of who made more money or what. It fell into that because in the end, his job makes more money. In the end, yeah. he was yeah. able to be more consistent and stable by showing up every day because I was staying home to pick up the kids when they were sick from school. So in the end, we ended up in the same place as everyone else, despite all that work ahead of time. And it's frustrating and it's demoralizing that we had to marry so we could make more money for the children and also to have more rent. I had to give up my last name. I had to give up a lot of my autonomy, a lot of my jobs and billets that I had to pass up because the second they found out I was married with kids, they were like, hey, we don't want you forward deployed. And I'm like, no, he is too. Like, we're fine. We can move together. That's not a thing. And they're just like, well, we don't want moms to be missing out on their babies. And I'm just like, that's totally not a you decision, but okay. So I missed out on billets. I missed out on so many things. My career ended not the way that I wanted it to. I wanted to stay in for life. It wasn't in the cards. And it's demoralizing to have so many things that you want for yourself not being able to happen and to have that being narrowed down and narrowed down over time. But now it's opening back up again as the kids get older. As the kids get older and yeah. addressing health issues, I'm like 20 years behind everyone else. And that's fine. Whatever. It's Nobody's racing against each other. But now that things are opening back up again, I can reassess and start having my own career and separating myself and not feeling that dependency anymore. The other requirement was when I was married, we are having both of our names in all vehicles and all houses, period. Any own land ownership. We will split those 50-50 if it comes to something. As much as that hurt his feelings in the sense of, well, don't you trust me? I had to point out to him how many guys came back from the war completely different than what they were before just because they got knocked on the head one too many times. How many? Count them. How many people left as happy-go-lucky guys that were married and came back and started beating their wives? I cannot financially afford to do that. So I will have my own FU fund trying to censor myself. It's hard, <laughs> but I will have my own FU fund. I have $7,000 in the bank right now. That is my name only period. He has no rights to it whatsoever. It is specifically listed in any sort of will in case I am disabled, but that money is to be utilized for me only, not for anyone else. That is just there for my own safety and sanity because anytime that something goes wrong, anytime I switch my meds and I decide I hate everybody, Anytime that he decides that he's too stressed out and doesn't want to parent anymore, I remember I have a way out. It's going to be okay. But I had to fight for that emotionally within his family, within my own family. I had to explain myself over and over again, but there was no way in hell I was going anywhere without a nephew fund. It wasn't going to happen. So it was, these are things that I had to fight a lot harder for despite not having the energy to do so. So I want to take a quick pause to thank today's sponsor, ZocDoc. I feel like we've all felt at one time in our life that searching for the right doctor is like playing a bad game of Mad Libs. 
You need blank specialist who takes blank insurance and lives in your blank city within blank miles of you and has less than blank months wait for an appointment. But when it comes to your health and time, we should not have to treat it like a game. To that end, I'm happy to continue our partnership with our friends at ZocDoc for another episode of the Financial Confessions. And ZocDoc makes it easy to fill in all those blanks to help you find the right doctor for your specific needs. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare high quality in-network doctors, choose the right one for your needs, and click to instantly book an appointment. We're talking about in-network appointments with more than 100,000 healthcare providers across every specialty, from mental health to dental to eye care to skincare and much more. You can also see their actual appointment openings, choose a time that works for you, and click to instantly book a visit. Plus, ZocDoc appointments happen fast, typically within just 24 to 72 hours of booking. You can even score same-day appointments. As someone who is notorious for procrastinating things like doctor's appointments, I've actually been using ZocDoc for years, no joke, well before we even partnered with them as sponsors, and it has genuinely made the process so much less anxiety-inducing. Shout out to my doctors. So stop putting off those doctor's appointments and go to ZocDoc.com TFC to find and instantly book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash TFC. ZocDoc.com slash TFC. It's interesting when you talk about um, how early in the relationship he was sort of forced to learn all of these skills because there wasn't mm-hmm. another option because you were physically not there. What you're describing is what a lot of women experience in divorce, you know, and, you know, women often will report higher levels of, you know, happiness and satisfaction post-divorce mm-hmm. in part because they do now have these carved out, dedicated um periods of time where their ex is forced to be the primary parent, but whereas before they always sort of had this um, sort of invisible buffer of, you know, the woman who would either intentionally or not kind of step in and provide a lot of that labor. So I think what you're describing in terms of, you know, the, the men often having to learn by brute force essentially is true in in a lot of situations. Um, You seem like a person who has a really nuanced and interesting view on the military. I never served in the military, but I am from a military town and used to be a WAG, a a Naval Academy WAG myself. Um, And so therefore have quite a lot of people in my life who either um, served, were espoused to an active Mm. duty military uh, personnel, what have you. And kind of anecdotally, I've noticed that a lot of these couples and marriages um, tend to be pretty complicated, tend to, you know, have a lot of issues. And, you know, we talk, for example, when we speak about things like MLMs, often it is explicitly targeting things like military spouses, um, not just because there's often not a ton of opportunity for gainful employment on, you know, when they're stationed somewhere, but also because um, to your earlier point, there is often a higher, um, need and desire to provide one's own financial independence. I'm wondering in your view, as someone who does have these complicated views of the military, do you think it's sort of a a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense of the military intentionally attracting people who already come from problematic personal or family situations, low income, et cetera, or is it something that happens when you're serving that ends up causing a lot of these personal problems or both? Yes, and it is hilarious to me that I try to explain to people that I am of trailer trash, which I believe to be a very strong and resilient group of impoverished people without landed property. We are the non-landed gentry, as it were, where it's like we have the benefits of being white, but we don't have any of the other benefits that go along with it. But a lot of the people around me deluded themselves into thinking they're like, well, at least we're better than those people. Nobody's better than anyone. We're all just struggling to survive out here. But My favorite part about that is we were marketed to the most about what it means to be a good citizen, what it means to take pride in defending one's country. So they're going like the basic bottom layer of like, I don't really like referring to Maslow, but it's something that we seem to all know apparently. But like the basic foundation of physical security, consistent food, and the need to feel like you're a good person. They hit on all of those hardcore and they hit the poorest people the hardest. And so what you're getting is the poorest people from all around the country, 
all around any of our territories, any places that we've colonized, any super fun groups that we've taken over, and you're smashing us all together, and we all have that one need to feel good about ourselves in common, right? Now, you put them on an isolated base. You send them off to train to fight in a war to dehumanize themselves. You send them to do a bunch of training that is not conducive to saying, hey, wait a minute, I don't think that's a great idea. And you cram them all together and then you keep them in like strict rigidity. And those of us with ADHD need that structure. So we tend to thrive in the military, which is really complicated if you absolutely hate what the military does later on. But it's like, wow, the murder machine really does do good things for my brain. It's a really complicated, hard feeling to have. But when you're marketed that to as a child and you join right out of high school instead of going to college, either because A, you can't afford it or B, in my case, I wasn't going to spend anyone else's money when all I wanted to do was kiss boys and get laid. Like I didn't want to, I wanted to get paid to travel. I didn't want to do anything like the 17 year old me really could not fathom sitting down and doing more school. Cause I was struggling so hard to do school in the first place. I was just like, I need to do something entirely different. There is no way I can justify asking for money to go to an education. I might not even show up for that seems cruel. I'm not doing it. So it's like, so when you're being targeted that hard though, and that's what you're gathering. And then you take those people away from home. The only support structure that they have, they're lonely. The first thing they want is mommy wife, right? They're like, I don't want my mom because she's kind of broken down and sad, but I also kind of want someone warm and cozy to sleep with. They don't sit you down and have you force those feelings and wait until after. No, you get married at 18 and 19 when you're not even fully formed yet with individuals. And then you throw in more children on top of it because that's the next step in a checklist society. That's the next step. Well, you're married. You should have kids now. And so it's like a sliding scale of all the things you can do to make your life substantially worse when first coming out of poverty, when you're coming out of broken homes, when you're coming out of domestic violence, when you're coming out of things that are like not even addressed fully and you're not even fully formed. Let's throw that all on top of you all at once to create the next generation of people vulnerable enough to join the service. Because the people who are volunteering now are the same people that it was a couple hundred years ago. It's the people who look at that and say, you know what, getting shot at might be my best opportunity. And nobody stops to say why. But most of us military brats, we all kind of know each other. Like, I know all the people who did like satellite installation stuff from my dad's side of the military, because that's who we followed around. I know who's related to whom. And when you're dating, it's kind of hard to date outside the pool if the pool is the ocean and you're on a boat and you're kind of trapped with people, but you're lonely and horny because you're a teenager. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I'm not surprised by that. And I'm not saying that it's like an intentional thing where someone's sitting around in a dark room being like, hey, we've got a lot of people who are psychologically messed up and continuing to breed. Can we help anybody? And their answer is, nah, we need more people for the recruits down the road. I don't think anyone's actually saying that. I think what they're saying is, yeah, but all those military brats, as we refer to ourselves lovingly, join the military themselves. So we're kind of like inbreeding with each other. It's kind of gross, but there's not a lot of opportunity to get out unless you forcefully yeah. run. Yeah, it is really interesting coming from, uh, it's not very common to have a very, very um, sort of military, a, a culture where there's like a military presence is extremely prevalent, but it's also affluent, um, which is definitely the case for Annapolis. Like ROTC was a humongous part of our high school. Yeah. Like the Naval Academy was like the most aspirational thing that anyone could do. Um, and yet most of the student makeup of the Naval Academy, I mean, there definitely is a mix still, but it's, it's much, much more affluent than the average um, sort uh, of uh, population coming into the military. Go ahead. their hearts. I love the officers that came from the academies who had mommies and daddies who cared about them. They are the cutest and the sweetest with their little hopes and their little dreams and their little uniforms. And they're just like, well, it says here that I'm supposed to be an inspiring leader. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm going to inspire you with a speech. And I'm like, you could pay us more or just leave us alone. Those would be more inspiring to be frank. But I would be like almost a person who had lived two horrible childhoods together coming in contact with what people would consider to be like the ideal childhood and seeing the result of that and being like, you are the softest, squishiest 20 year old I have ever seen. I will never listen to a word you say. I'll do it. 
because I have to, because the option is prison. That's what happens if I don't listen to you. I go to prison. So I have to, but man, you guys are so soft and cuddly. It's like you envy them on the one hand where you're like, man, people really cared about your well-being. So it's like a level of disdain that's not their fault, but it is intentional. <laughs> where it's like the more affluent people are kept away from us on purpose because we're the broken folk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for real. Uh, it is. <laughs> I always do wonder, though, outside of like, I mean, in the case of um, a lot of the people that I knew personally, I think there was just. Because you ask yourself, I think in 2024, I don't think that many people, kind of regardless of political affiliation, are not okay. pretty damn disillusioned by our military and by our military's exploits. I think that's, in fact, becoming one of the most, to me, compelling political trends in the last 10 years is because I remember, you know, you and I were in high school during the Bush administration. Yeah. If you were right wing at that the time, like, I joined the military yeah. under Bush. Yes. Yeah. Yikes. Um, but I think we all remember clearly that like during that time, like a very strong, not just nationalist, but, you know, a, a sort of aggressive nationalist, expansionist, imperialist view of America's role in the world was like pretty much the hallmark of a conservative worldview. I mean, there were other things, but like that was pretty consistent. Whereas today, I feel like and we see it in the stats and the polling, even when you just have conversations with people, even on the right wing and especially to the far right wing, there's a much more anti-military, isolationist, anti-expansionist view of what America's role should be. And my just kind of my wonder, my my something I think about a lot is where how is the military going to continue to recruit, especially at those higher levels, because Obviously, you will have desperate poverty for a very long time, probably even more so the way things are going. But, mm -hmm. you know, for in, in my generation, the people who were attracted to, you know, officer training, the Naval Academy, West Point, et cetera, those were generally people who came from families that were either military officers, officers themselves or who mm -hmm. had a very fundamentally kind of conservative social political view. Um, and now I sort of wonder, like, where do we go when no one's really rah-rah about the military, you know? It, it strikes me as funny because, like, it's the same situation we face as being, you know, considered female. I'm only going to speak in generalities because, you know, I want to acknowledge that there's more than two genders, of course. But it's like, you know, for me, speaking. Yeah. So when um, it comes to, like, having these discussions where I'm like, well, they'll do what they've always done. They either recreate the situation that gave them the most which is recreate the poverty, which gave them the most volunteers, or they start recruiting the people who want to be there the most. I had so many bosses in upper echelons of military, like just because of the job that I had, my chain of command to the president was really short. So it was kind of like a, not like a brag. It was just, my thing was so niche that that happened that way. It wasn't like I was super special. I was a punk just like everybody else. But it was like, when these are the people making the decisions, you kind of have to wonder like, now what person who firmly believes that they need the second coming of Christ to happen, of course they're going to sacrifice everybody. Of course they're going to start doing a draft and grabbing all the pores. Of course they're going to create more poverty so they don't have to make a draft because nobody likes that anyway. Like, what is the next logical step? So it's like, the next logical step is probably going to be the most banal evil thing you can think of. And it's not even like an intentional, like, I've got a cat, I'm going to stroke it gently and turn around in this chair slowly kind of evil. That would be fun. But the boring kind. We need more poor people to go to war to get more stuff. That's it. And it's once it's boiled down to that point, it really strips away all the honor and the rah-rah and the song and the unicorn. And I'm proud to be an American. You, you've talked a bit um, here and in your email about how um, your upbringing uh, kind of put you in the position to not only kind of be preyed upon by the military, both in enlisting and then being assaulted during your service, um, mm -hmm. but also made it so that you had to grow up financially really quickly and kind of, you know, fend for yourself, essentially. Um, if you're open to it, could you talk a little bit about how, as an adult, you both look back on your upbringing, how you interact with your family now, and then how it kind of influences the way you are parenting and you're a mother? I will do anything that I can 
to support my children, period. It's, I know that that comes across as being like the, you're of the softer generation, et cetera. And I'm like, no, I'm considered the strictest mom because I have regular bedtimes. I keep consistency because I never had it as a child. I make sure that I am maintaining my relationship with my husband, despite it not being the perfect relationship. He has so much that he can teach the children that I cannot, that I just don't know how to do. Like what day is it? What time is it? Managing money, those types of things. And so making sure that I'm keeping the prime directive in the forefront of my mind, which is to provide as much resource, time, and energy to my children as possible. I can't do that if I'm completely wasted away. That means I have to make a lot of sacrifices in regards to selecting anything from medication to what foods that I eat. Because as much as I would enjoy being on medication that helps me feel music again, that can help me do art again, that can help me feel like I'm connected to the world, my children need consistency when they're younger. They can be exposed more to my ups and downs later. It taught me that I can literally rebuild from anything. That worst case scenario, I've been homeless and I've been worked jobs that were considered the worst of the worst. I've done it before and I can do it again. With that foundational background, literally anything else really seems like gravy. I'm sitting in a comfortable, warm home with a husband who kind of likes me, I guess, with cats who treat me like humans like we have a relationship and I have a good relationship with my children because they know that I can and I will do anything to protect them. But it also means that I am alone a lot. It means that when it comes to religious upbringing on my dad's side, which is more of the Mormon section, the more Protestant conservatism that comes from my husband's side of the family, it means I don't really get to talk to anybody as much and it sucks, but I'm not raising my kids under patriarchal ideals. They will not get married or have children until they are damn well ready to, period, if they want to. There's no pressure to have grandchildren. There is no pressure to get married. There's not even a pressure to move out. Like, I'm not doing that to, to my children whatsoever. I do expect them to try their best, but I will not accept any of the nonsense that says that I have to physically eject my children or I have to be anything. Anybody who comes to me and says, you're being too soft, you're being too whatever, I'm just like, hey, man. I've seen the other options and they all suck. So no, I'm not doing that to my own kids. Thanks, bye. It is very lonely. Do you mind if I ask if your mother is still in your life? She's quite dead. Um, for the last couple of years of my life, I tried very hard to support her financially when I realized that that wasn't going to do anything to help her because she would just squander anything I sent her. Um, I moved her into my home, which was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. But I still had a hope. I had a hope that she would see me as more than just someone who was designed and bred to care for her. I was created specifically to be an emotional stopgap for my mother, who was lonely and miserable all the time, to take care of her and then later to serve. I continuously have to fight against the urge to serve at all times, to sit down and not be constantly cleaning and serving and fixing. And I need to help someone else. Otherwise, I am not valuable that my worth only comes from that, came from her. And a stand society at large, obviously. I'm not, it's not all her fault. Like, she's broken for her own reasons. But she died a couple of years ago during the pandemic. Uh, I was here in Alaska. I could not bury her, but I had to cut her out of my life. I had to stop talking to her. She wasn't going to go to therapy. She wasn't going to have a good relationship with her grandchildren. I tried, and it didn't work, so I had to kick her out of my house. And it sucks. I made sure she was set up somewhere safe. And then I said, I can't live with you anymore. I can't keep trying until you start trying. Until then, we're done. And then she died. And the hardest part of her dying was the death of a hope. The death of the hope that she would figure out, oh, I don't need to treat people transactionally. Oh, I don't need to psychologically abuse everyone around me. I can be rebuilt and people will forgive me because they love me. Instead of doing that, she died. And it hurt so, so badly. But I also felt a lot of relief, and I still feel relieved. But she's in an urn downstairs, and I talk to her every day. Where I say, hey, Mom, look, dusted. You're dusted now. Congratulations. She says nothing because she's dead. It's uh, The best relationship I ever had with my mother was in a shiny silver urn, which is both dark and hilarious if you, you know, just knew our background together. We have great conversations all the time, completely one-sided. I know her death must have been... A complicated experience. I think uh, we've had, we've spoken to a lot of people on this channel who've 
experienced an uncomfortable mix of sadness, guilt, relief, anger, loss. Um, you know, in our conversation today, you've described a lot of losses of hope, a lot of limitations, a lot of frustrations. I'm really interested, what gives you joy? What gives you hope? What gives you motivation? What makes you look forward to things? I'm going to start from the darkest and work my way up. The darkest is spite. I've had nothing but a consistent stream <laughs> of people and situations. If there is an infinite is that just said, hey, that's a nice tower you got there. Be a shame if someone came and knocked it down. But instead of like giving up and like crying or something, I keep rebuilding it and be like, do it again. See what happens. Do it again. And they do it again. Nothing happens to them because obviously I can't do anything about it. And I'm like, yeah, look, now I put the triangle on top this time. What you going to do about it? It's like the pettiest level of spite. But it's like when everything hits rock bottom, it's my favorite part of myself. That's just like, well, you know what? No, screw you. I'm going to do it again anyway. I have failed out of college eight times now. Eight. I keep trying to use my GI Bill because I'm terrible at school. I have hardcore ADHD. I can't read a paragraph without falling asleep or getting distracted and creating characters out of equations. Like I am so distractible. There's no way I'm doing college, but because I keep going, I'm just like, eventually, eventually, I'm going to finish a degree in something. I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be underwater basket weaving, but I'm going to keep going until they make me stop. I'm not, no. So spite is the first one. And the second one is that I have a genuine love of nature and of people, of watching them grow and develop, which is my less selfish, but still selfish reasons why I love being a mom, is I love watching my children take in information, Right. And in their own special filtered ways, come up with something different than I completely would have ever thought of. Like they have a problem and how they solve it is endlessly fascinating. Always hilarious. I love watching the cats solve their problems. I try to be more like the cats. When in doubt, take a nap. That seems fantastic. A bad coping skill if you have young children, but as you get older, when in doubt, take a nap seems awesome. I love watching nature take back what's theirs. Like, as I'm watching, like, nature take back over civilization, I'm just like, yeah, you go, little buddy. The little tree that's fighting my deck tooth and nail, and I'm like, I don't need a deck. Take the deck, tree, go for it. And it's just like, go, little tree, go. You can do it. So I find so much joy in that. But because I have ADHD, my hobby is other hobbies. Sitting around me right now, there's, like, art around me that I created. I am cross-stitching things. I'm learning to embroider, so there's that there. Oh, wow, it looks nice. I'm, I'm making like a full table runner. Will I finish the table runner? Oh. No. I have, I have given myself permission to start and end any hobby that I want to at any point, just as long as I'm willing to let go of the stuff if someone else expresses an interest in that hobby. So if someone else says, hey, I want to learn how to knit, I have to be with them all of my knitting things. That's how I keep the flow of things going. But that is what one of my like financial needs is, is I need to continuously start new hobbies. That's why I had, had, it doesn't work at the moment, um, the Yeti microphone I was telling you about because I started narrating books for my children because they liked how I read oh. stories. Yeah, I learned how to book binding. I learned how to like knit and crochet. I started out learning to launch missiles and satellites, like, you know, queen of the ocean, death and destruction. That's where I went. Now I'm making doilies. And I like my doilies. I need to find one. I put doilies on everything. It's my favorite. I love it. So it's like, but you can still be your dark, twisted self of like misery and like a ball of neuroses and still end up liking things like I like putting on dresses occasionally. I put makeup on sometimes. Sometimes I don't. I pick up hobbies that are like, I'm going to crochet a doily and then I'm going to put, put it underneath a plant and just leave it there for my husband to find because he hates that I put doilies on things. It is our marital argument that I love. It is my favorite. But yeah, so that feeds me is having the dumbest marital arguments, spite and picking up hobbies whenever I get bored. Makes me happy. As a last question, um, you are someone who has uh, a limited ability to uh, sort of make your own uh, decisions financially follow a lot of the financial advice that you see. Um, but you have, despite that built a pretty solid financial structure within those limitations. What is your number one piece of advice for someone listening who feels like 
none of the financial advice they listen to applies to them, but they want to be financially stable. If you remove the fear of homelessness, if you remove the fear of failure, because it's not you that is failing, it is not you, it is not your fault that we live in a system that any mild brain messed up or your parents sucking or the timing being wrong, or maybe a kid has a disease and that medical care isn't free. None of that is your fault. So if you remove a lot of the shame and the guilt and really sit with it, why do I feel guilty that my kids have holes in their socks? Because I can't afford to get them socks. Why do I feel guilty about socks not being good enough for my children when they're just going to destroy it anyway? If, once you start removing that, it takes off a lot of that pressure to then be doing whatever it is, like being at the same level that your mom was when at certain age, or you're not a good enough providing mommy person, right? The system already sucks. It's not you. So pick the things that mean the most to you. When you were a kid, I lived in a hoarder house. My mom collected things and never got rid of them. Things died. It was awful. I'm a neat freak now. Cleanliness is important. It might not be to you. Pick the parts of cleanliness that are important. Do the bare minimum of what those things are and spend the rest of that time trying to find ways to enjoy times with your family and your children. Because those time is a resource that, that goes out. It, people die. It sucks. When you can't do that, cut out all the crap that is just kind of middling there of like, well, I have to keep a proper wardrobe or attire. Keep the pieces that you like. Everything else can get effed. Like, just keep the things that you think you need for just that situation. Narrow it down. And once you get rid of all the crap that other people have put on you, the shoulds, and you should have better this, you should have better that, it all feels so much better. And it sucks. And it sounds like like the biggest, you know, like wooey thing that anyone can, from like an atheist communist can say, but it's not your fault. Pick the prime directive that you want, go in that direction and drunkenly walk your way towards it. There is no straight and narrow path there. Well, thank you, Jessica, so much for joining us and for sharing your story. I think uh, your honesty will help a lot of people in the audience. I'm personally very excited to read these comments because um, I know there's going to be some really interesting conversations down there. Um, and just generally, I think uh, we are really sort of smothered by a culture that um, is just really incapable of being honest and transparent about these things that, to your point, are so wrapped up in shame um, and, you know, everyone trying to pretend all the time that everything's okay. So, um, again, thank you so much. I know you don't have anything in particular you want to promote, but um if there's anything you want to say, any message you want to leave us with. When you are protecting your financial future, you are protecting your children from yourself. You are protecting your children and yourself from your spouse. We are all one head injury away from becoming monsters. That's not a fault thing. That's not you planning for the worst and being a negative Nancy. That's reality. My parents, like my great grandmothers, the women on the Finnish side of my family of Finland, they would go through husbands like dirty sheets, like they had six or seven husbands. Now, I'm not saying all of them were on accidental, I'm not saying all of them were on purpose. I'm just saying this ain't new. Preparing for the worst is OK. And it's OK to say, hey, I'm not saying, honey, I'm not saying to yourself, you're crappy and I have to plan against you eventually failing. This is I am planning to support the best version of you. If you become an alcoholic, I want to make sure that the children remember you as you are now not as the person that you have become due to circumstances outside of us. I am protecting the children from whatever monsters we might become. And that's not your fault. That's not a bad thing. That's just practical. That's not. So don't wrap it up into something it ain't. All right. Thank you everyone at home for joining us. And uh, thank you again, Jessica, for, for being here. And we will see you next week on an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us and be sure to tune in next week for an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. The Financial Confessions is created by The Financial Diet and hosted by me, Chelsea Fagan. It is produced by Alexa Brooks Major and Holly Trantham. Recording and editing by Emily Fisher and music and sound effects are from Epidemic Sound. Want more of our content? Head over to our YouTube page, The Financial Diet, to see our monthly deep dives, videos of this show, and our entire backlog of videos and podcasts. I'll talk to you next week.